Turn your Bibles to, to Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew 9, um, 15 and 12. Uh, three chapters. We're going to look at just three little snippets of, of Jesus' teaching. And in and, and most of the teaching today, Jesus is talking with uh, Pharisees and, or, or scribes or, or Sadducees, the, the religious leaders. Um, these, these people did not have a, a problem with head knowledge. Um, they had a problem with uh, the heart, directing their heart the right, the right way, and also the hands actually living out and practicing what they, what they preached. We're in a series called Head, Heart, and Hands because I firmly believe that God wants to bring all three of these areas of our life under his discipline. Now, um, when a, a preacher says the word discipline, right, everyone kind of goes, like, what's he, what's he talking about? Um, the word discipline just simply means to bring order to. Uh, to bring order to the chaos, to bring under instruction. Um, it, it means to guide in a particular direction. So we've got to understand this, that God um, wants to bring every area of our life under his discipline, under his authority, our head, our hearts, and our hands. And isn't it interesting that in English, the word discipleship um, at the root is this word discipline. And so as we are being discipled, as we are growing in our walk with Jesus Christ, we are positioning ourselves under the Lord's discipline or under his leadership. Um, and we've got to work with all three. Last week, I said that if you have um, the head knowledge and, and the heart, um, but you don't have the, the hands, it leads to arrogance. Um, if you have the, the hands to serve and, and you have the uh, the head knowledge, but you don't have the heart, it leads to burnout. Um, and if you have the, uh, what is it, the heart and the hands without the head, you have misguided direction, right? And so we need all three chairs of the stool or, or the table to be working in tandem with one another. Let me pare it down a little bit more. If we only have head knowledge, you know what that's called? Legalism. Legalism. And that's very dangerous, very dangerous in the church for us only to be kind of operate up here in our knowledge. And we want everyone to kind of uh, to go up to that to that knowledge. And we can uh, very easily kind of slip into legalism. If we only have hearts, that's called emotionalism. If we're only guided by our heart, listen, what, what we do is we tend to get passionate about whatever is the next thing. Whatever is the buzzword, whatever is the hot topic, we get passionate about that one thing, right? It's just emotionalism, right? It's not rooted anywhere. There's no substance to it. And then lastly, if we only operate with our hands, if we're people who, who doesn't really care about what you know about God or, or having the right heart, it's just about doing, then we will always struggle with humanism. You know, we, we might pride ourselves in the fact that we serve others, but if we don't incorporate the gospel into that service, if we don't do that service with an act of love that's directed towards God, with, then we just fall into a, a religion of, of humanism. So we can see very clearly that God wants to bring all three of these areas under his discipline. Last week, we talked about the head, knowledge. What do we need to know? We need to know him, right? That's, that's kind of it, pure and simple. That's the goal that Paul talked about, to know him. And as we know him, we know what he desires. Then we can know his will and things like that. Today, we're going to talk about the heart. Turn to your neighbor and say, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. Um, you know, if, if I were honest, I would much rather someone challenge me in the area of my knowledge, right? I, I need to grow. I need to learn more. I need to know him uh, better, more intimately, more personally, and I would even, um, I wouldn't mind for someone to come in and challenge me in the area of my actions. Andy, you need, to, you need to stop these bad habits. You need to start these habits. You need to live out your faith more in this area and that area. Like we can, we can see that. But when it comes to that transformation of the heart, whoo, that's hard, isn't it? Imagine, uh, let me use sandwich. Um, God bless the sandwich, right? Whoever invented the sandwich. Um, imagine you met someone who'd never had a sandwich before in their life. They didn't know how to make a sandwich, right? You could teach them how to make a sandwich. You can give them the knowledge on how to create that beautiful masterpiece, and they could learn. They could expand their knowledge. Now, if they started making sandwiches every single day so they could feed themselves, then you could come alongside them and say, hey, you also need to make sandwiches to serve other people, 
right? You're not called just to feed yourself. You're called to, to help feed others and take care of others, the people that God has placed around your life. And so let me show you, let me demonstrate for you what it looks like to not only make sandwiches, but to serve sandwiches. Are you with me? Say, I'm with you. All right, don't, don't start dreaming about sandwiches, okay? And don't check out for lunch just yet. Now, what if you crave sandwiches? You love sandwiches. You've been having sandwiches for decades now. Sandwiches is your favorite thing. You wake up thinking about sandwiches. You go to bed thinking about sandwiches. And I were to sit down with you today and say, you know what? Sandwiches are of the devil. You need to stop loving sandwiches. You, you see how, much, how difficult that is to change the heart desire it's, it's difficult to learn, but it's not as difficult. It's difficult to change our actions, but it's not as difficult as putting our hearts out there before the Lord and saying, Lord, if there is a desire of my heart that is incongruent with you, that is incongruent with what you desire, then Lord, I want to surrender that desire to you. You recognize how hard that is? Think about something that you love with all your heart. And imagine, like, whatever it is, imagine if God were to step in and say, I need you to change that desire. Like, that's, that's difficult. That's challenging. But it's necessary. Now, I'm, my prayer for you is that God would begin to identify the things in your heart that are incongruent with his heart. And that he would, in his gentleness, in his grace, in his kindness, that he would begin to prune these areas of our heart to make room for the, that spiritual growth for the things that he does desire. So let's, let's start here with um, this verse in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Um, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, he, he writes this down. He says, guard your heart above all else. Guard your heart. Above all else. Some versions, above all else, guard your heart. This is so important. Why? Because it is the source of life. Now, Solomon wasn't talking about your heart beating just keeps your blood flowing and it just keeps you alive. But it is the heart that is at the root of everything we do. I want you to think about that. Our thoughts, like we think in our mind, but where do those thoughts originate? In our heart. So if you start thinking about what you think about, it's an indicator of what's going on in your heart. Now, every word we say, guess what? Where does it originate? Where do our, the words that we say, where do those originate? From our heart. Have you ever said something and you immediately said, oh, I didn't mean to say that? You know what's true? Yeah, you did. You, you did mean to say it. Because if you didn't mean to say it, then you wouldn't have said it. But, but, the, but whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Let me say it. But because you said it, right, it originated right there in your heart. The things that we do, our actions, where does that originate? It originates in our heart. Let me throw this one out. The things that we ought to do, the good that we ought to do but we don't do, that passivity also originates within the heart. So Solomon says, look, guard your heart above all else because it is the source of life. Uh, this morning, I want to give you three points um, about the heart, and we're going to um, read some stories in Matthew. The first thing is this. God sees your heart. God sees your heart. We just wrapped up the King Saul series, and remember when uh, God said to Saul, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to a man after my own, say it with me, heart. Uh, he sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, and he says, I want you to go and anoint the next king of Israel. So Jesse brings out the firstborn son, right? The man who's like big and strong, and, and uh, God says, that's not him, pass. Brings out the next one, God says, that's not him, pass. And, and Samuel, I imagine, is thinking like, really? He looks like a king to me. Looks like good stock, right? He's the firstborn, um, but God passes and passes and passes until he gets to young David, this little shepherd boy, and he says, that's him. And God tells Samuel that people judge according to outward appearance. You judge because of the external appearance. You judge based on what you see. And God says, but I judge based on the what? On the heart. You judge on the external. Here's what I see. Here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the heart. 
Jesus talked about this when he was giving that Sermon on the Mount. It's not just what we do that matters. Motivation matters as well. Are we doing things just to be seen by other people? Or are we doing things out of a heart that is really motivated and moved by a love for God? So listen, God sees your heart. Um, I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 9. I want to read the story where um, Jesus heals a man who's paralyzed. And just to comment, he heals the man paralyzed because of the faith of his friends. Listen, church, you need people of faith surrounding you. God, God works in our life through us, but he also works in our life through the people that we surround ourselves with. And this paralyzed man was blessed to have some friends who brought him to Jesus and seeing their faith. Jesus told the, par, uh, the paralytic, um, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So he heals him of his physical disability, but he also heals him of his spiritual disability. He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, to tell someone your sins are forgiven, that would be like calling yourself God because only God can forgive sins. And so the scribes are in the background. They, they see what Jesus is doing. They heard that he's forgiven this man's sins. Um, verse three, at this, some of the scribes said to themselves, he's blaspheming. Now, who did they say it to? Who did they say it to? themselves. They said it to themselves. They didn't say this out loud. They didn't say it to Jesus. They didn't say it to the crowds. They're just in the background watching what's going on, and they kind of murmur, he is blaspheming. Can you believe what he did? He just forgave sins. Only God can forgive sins, right? They're thinking all these things, and here's what Jesus says. Perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? Whoo, they're called on the carpet right in front of everybody. Not because of something they said with their lips, but something they said with their hearts. Jesus sees their hearts. God sees your heart. Isn't that both comforting and terrifying all at the same time? Why is it comforting that God sees our heart? It's comforting because it means we don't have to be fake in front of him. Like we, we tend to pretend and put on a mask and we might be fake in front of other people. No one here would do that, of course. But there's a lot of people that go to church and they put on a front. They put on a show and they're fake. That's exhausting. It's exhausting. We try to cover up the, the hangups in our life and the, and the hurts in our life and the issues that we're facing. But Man, we're called to, to transparency. I'm not saying that, that you have to get up before the church every week and just bear all of your heart in front, of, in front of everybody, but we need to have people around us in our lives that we can be open and honest and transparent with, people who can see into our hearts. So there's a relief that comes knowing that, that we can't pretend in front of God. We might can pretend in front of other people, but God sees our heart. That is comforting, but it's also terrifying. Why? Because God sees our hearts, and he sees and he perceives the very thoughts of our hearts. Notice that Jesus said, I um, why are you thinking about these things in your heart? He doesn't say you're thinking about them in your mind. He goes to the root. You're thinking about these things in your heart. Can you imagine being one of the disciples and just realizing that everything you think, <laughs> Jesus is aware of, like he knows can you imagine Jesus and Peter having a conversation? Hey, Peter, how you doing? How you doing, bud? Oh, I'm doing great, Lord. You know, I said my prayers this morning. He's like, really? You want to answer that question again? I see your heart. See how terrifying that would be? But think about this. God sees our heart. He knows the sinful condition, and yet he pursues us anyway. He pursues us anyway. So we don't have to be fake in front of him. We don't have to cover up. We can come to him just as we are. Listen, God sees our heart. Uh, number two, there's trouble in your heart. There is trouble in your heart. Jeremiah uh, 17 verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else. It is incurable. It's beyond cure. Here's what that means. It means you can't fix it. You can't fix it. So we have trouble in our heart. As we, as we put our heart before the Lord, what we recognize is there is trouble in the heart. Let's flip over a few chapters to Matthew chapter uh, 15. Matthew chapter 15. Um, again, Jesus is having one of those conversations with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, ask, uh, the Pharisees ask Jesus this question. 
Why do your disciples break the tradition of men by not washing their hands before they eat? They skip the prerel. Okay, they are not cleaning their hands. That is dirty. That is filthy. They are defiled people. They have broken the traditions of the elders. And Jesus, like he always does, right, he responds to the question with a question. He says, all right, why do your traditions of the elders break the commandments of God? (laughs) You're putting the standard up here. Let me take you to a higher standard. Your traditions are breaking what God says. And he sheds some light on that. And then Jesus opens up the conversation to everyone in the crowd. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 10. If you're there, Sam, there. All righty. Thank you for being so excited about it today. Um, Verse 10. Summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. In other words, pay attention. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. It's not what you eat. It's not what you take in that defiles your your life or your heart. It's what comes out that defiles your life and your heart. Verse 12, the disciples came and told him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? Hey, Jesus, you offended the Pharisees. Did you know that? Just bringing it to your attention. That's all. Just wanted you to know. They're, they're ticked off right now. You made it. You upset them. We, we should kind of put up the guard, you know, be wary about what we say. Don't, don't dive too deep here. And here's how he replied. Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be uprooted. <laughs> There's sometimes when Jesus responds to things that just kind of make you scratch your head. Okay, they're telling him, you've offended the Pharisees, and he starts talking about God's secret garden. Every plant that God didn't plant, God uproots. Anybody a little bit confused? Not tracking with Jesus all the way? He says, leave them alone. They are blind gods. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter said, I like Peter. (laughs) I can relate to Peter. Uh, Explain this parable to us. What's going on here? You changed gears. We were talking about heart issues. We were talking about the Pharisees being mad. You went off on the plant um, illustration again. And Jesus said, do you still lack understanding? That's, that's got to be hard to hear from your Lord and Savior. Do you, do you still not get it? Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. What comes out of the heart is what defiles the person. So then we must ask, well, what comes out of the heart? Jesus tells us, for from the heart, here it is, come Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, theft, false testimonies, slander. That's all bad stuff, isn't it? These are the things that defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. The Pharisees are aiming at the wrong target. They are judging the book by the wrong cover. The issue is not eating without washing your hands. Because it's not what comes in that makes us unclean. It's what comes out that makes us unclean. What's Jesus doing? He's getting to the root of the problem, isn't he? It's not the plant. It's not the fruit that you should be concerned with. You should be concerned with the root. And here's what he says. Here's the parable. Any plant that's not rooted in God, it's not a, it's not a plant that God plants. What does he do with it? He says, oh, that's cute. Let's let it hang out with the others. No, it says that he uproots that plant. That's serious business, folks. A tree, a plant that's not rooted in God, it's not planted by God, he says, it goes out of the garden. So let's back up a couple more chapters and get a little more context here. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus often talks about gardening and Um, fields and vineyards and sowing seeds. And um, here in Matthew 12, verse 33, he says, either make a tree good and its fruit will be good or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Um, How do you make a tree good or bad? How do you do that? You don't shake your finger at it, right? Bad tree. That's a good tree. 
how do you make a tree good or make a tree bad? It's the roots, right? You don't address the, the fruit or the branches. You go to the roots. You either water and, and provide good soil. That will produce a good tree, which produces good fruit. Or you take all those things away, and it's not getting the nutrients and nourishment that it needs, and it's a bad tree. It produces bad fruit. And then in verse 34, he says, brood of vipers. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. And, and, and this term here was like, whoo, that was a weighty, like, people in church today would say, oh, Jesus said what? What did he say? Now, I look at the word brood, and I studied it this week, because I've never, in my 37 years and 11 months of living on planet Earth, I have never, ever heard anyone use the word brood in a sentence until this past Thursday night. We're having dinner at my in-law's house celebrating my father-in-law's birthday, and um, Uncle Joe Dan steps in and says, you know who I saw at the restaurant the other day, and he names a couple. He said, yep, they were there with their brood. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I've never heard that word used. I've been studying it all week, and here you are, throwing out, just throwing out the word brood like it's been in your vocabulary all your life. <laughs> what I learned this week about brood is it's basically, it's your offspring. It's your, it's your children. Um, we have chickens at our house, and we have a, a chicken. Um, it's actually named Nugget, is this particular chicken. Um, <laughs> Charlie, Charlie named him Nugget, or her named her Nugget. Um, Nugget gets broody every couple of months. You know what? So I looked up, what does it mean to be broody? It means she's trying to hatch her eggs. She's going for the fruit, right? She's going for the offspring. So when Jesus says, you brood of vipers, he's basically saying, your spawns of Satan. That's the, oh, that's a hard word to call these guys. You are children of the devil. You could even say, you are bearing his fruit, and it's bad fruit. Brood of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good person produces good things from the storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. So basically, whatever you have going on here is what comes out here. But you know what we often do in our world and society and in people? We always try to address the external behavior don't we? Because that's what we can see, and that's what we judge, so we think we have to fix it at the external level, and Jesus is trying to prove this point. You can't fix it at the fruit level. You have to fix it at the root level. Can you imagine if you broke your arm today, and your way, and you're in a lot of pain, and your way to address the pain is by taking Tylenol, right? You, you would take a, a painkiller to address the pain, but you're not really addressing the source of the pain, are you? You're addressing the symptom of the pain. And there's a big difference. The difference is when you address the source of the pain, it leads to healing. When you address the symptoms of the pain, it just covers it up for a little bit. Then that pain comes back because you have not addressed the source. And you have to take more Tylenol to cover up that pain. And that pain that starts in your arm now spreads all over your body because you're not willing to address it at the source. That's the message of Jesus here. Listen, you can't just fix it at the external level by doing things that just make you feel good for a temporary basis because it doesn't address the root. You got to go for the heart you got to address it right there. Here's what the Father does. When it's planted by him, it produces fruit. When it's not planted by him, it has to go. You hearing that, church? When it's planted by him, it produces fruit. When it's not planted by him, it has to go. So here's what we've learned so far. God sees our heart. That's comforting. Oh, that's troubling. What does he see in our heart? He sees trouble. He sees the sin. He sees the issues that we're that we're dealing with. He sees the, the brokenness. But let me wrap up with some good news. Number three, God offers you a new heart. God offers you a new heart. Remember, we started off talking about this. This is not something you can fix on your own. This is something God supernaturally has to do in us, transforming our heart. And here's why this is so important. In uh, Psalm 20. Uh, 
24, 34, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. The scripture says this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, we can't enter into his presence without a pure heart. It's not the external stuff. It's not the going to church. It's not the giving to the expansion fund. and It's not the helping others in need and serving. It's not the actions. It's the heart issue that has to be addressed. So here's what the Lord says in Ezekiel 36. This is uh, before Jesus came and died on the cross. God tells us exactly what he was going to do. In Ezekiel 34, I won't read the whole chapter, but here's the synopsis. The nation of Israel was in trouble. They were in trouble because they stopped teaching God's ways to their kids. They basically took God out of the schools is what they did. They basically, at the, at the government level, they stopped submitting to God's authority. They started trying to run things on their own. They took God out of the government. They began to break down all the things that God had established for them to say, if you do these things, it will be well for you. You will be blessed. They began to throw all those things out the door and say, God, we think we have a better way. They started to make idols of things. They started to worship. They created things over the creator. And God says, look, this is a problem. And so he allows his discipline to come on the nation of Israel. They get scattered into other nations. In Ezekiel 36, verse 24, God says, look, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bring you back. Here's what he says. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. I will also, here's what I'm also going to do. I'm going to clean you with water, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. What does God want to cleanse us from? Some of our impurities? No, all of your impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone, in other words, your your dead heart that doesn't work, and I will give you a heart of flesh, one that's living, one that does work. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and, um, and carefully observe my ordinances. All right. God says in Ezekiel 36, here's what I'm going to do. You've, you've gone astray. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to get to the heart. He's prophesying about what's to come. He says, I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to give you a new heart. What's the third thing? I'm going to put my spirit within you. Listen, church, that's exactly what God did through his son, Jesus Christ. When he went to the cross, his blood that was shed purifies us, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. All of it. Not not big ones and small ones, but all unrighteousness. Not just our past sins, but even the sins that we have yet to commit. He cleanses us from all all of that. He cleanses us and he gives us a new heart. I'm going to take out that heart of stone, the one that doesn't work, and I'm going to put in one that does work. One that I can mold, that I can shape, that I can put desires in and shape and form into the image of my son, Jesus Christ. And then lastly, I'm going to plant my spirit within you. Listen, when God plants his spirit within us, that spirit grows. But what does that spirit produce? We don't have to guess because the Bible tells us in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit is love fruit is joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. This is the fruit that the Spirit produces as we walk with Him and in Him and by Him and for Him. It happens automatically. We don't have to go and force it. It just begins to shine through. Why? Because we've addressed the problem at the heart level at the roots. We've made the tree good. We've made the tree good. We've moved away from a children of the devil and we're adopted into the family of God as a child of the king. That's good news, church. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Andy, I, 
I gave my life to Christ, but man, I'm, I'm, I don't have all that patience and that goodness and that kindness. I struggle with these things. That's because we're still walking in the flesh and we've got the flesh walking, the spirit walk kind of cohabitating in one life and, and there's a battle and Paul talks about that battle, about doing what he doesn't want to do and not doing what he knows he needs to do and man, thanks be to God, like what are we going to do? This wretched man that I am. And he says, oh, but Jesus. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So God prunes our heart, doesn't he? Oh, you're producing patience. That's good, but I'm going to prune so that you'll produce more patience. You're producing goodness. That's good, but I'm going to prune so that you'll produce more goodness. And this is the pruning work that God does in the life of the believer. Hey, but maybe you're here today and you're not a believer. You're not a child of God. You're not a follower of Jesus Christ. You still have that heart of stone. And you try different things, different ways to address the brokenness in your life on the external. Today, God's making it known. He's making it clear in your life that it's right here in the heart because everything flows from our heart. Guard your heart. It's the source of life. Today, I want to invite you to do something that requires faith, to do something that requires humility, to do something that requires dying to to self. And I want to invite you to join Jesus in a work that he wants to do in your life. The Bible's pretty clear. He doesn't come barging in saying, I'm taking over your hostage. But he waits for us to welcome him in. And the Bible says that we can do that very simply. And if I could give you just even some ABCs on how to do that. A, we have to acknowledge that we're, that we're separated from God because of our troubled heart. And we have to acknowledge that there's nothing that we can do to, to restore that relationship. B, we have to believe, believe in Jesus Christ, not just the head knowledge up here, but it means to put the weight of your life on him and to find rest in him, believing that what he did on the cross, he did for us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then see, we have to confess Jesus as Lord. It's not just about forgiveness. It's about making Jesus Christ the boss. That's what the word Lord means. It means he's in charge. He's commander. I'm willing to let him have access to every area of my life, but it starts right here in the heart. So I'd invite you to join me, church, to bow your heads and close your eyes and just just ask the Lord today, Lord, what are you you saying to me? God, your, your spirit is the teacher of truth. So God, teach me today, show me, put light on that area of my heart that needs to change. Maybe you've been operating the external and you've been frustrated, you've been burnt out because it's the heart. You know, sometimes we treat church like a gas station. We come in wanting to get refueled and then we live our life throughout the week going on empty and we come back to get refueled. And for some people, man, you can make it every two weeks. You can make it once a month. You make it at Christmas and Easter to get that refueling. But what if church is not about just coming to be refueled What if it's about coming to a hospital and placing our lives up on the operating table and saying, God, do some heart surgery today. God, examine my heart and see if there's any offensive way. Maybe you're here today and you need to pray to invite Jesus to come in and save you and give you that new heart. I wanna invite you just to to echo a prayer like this. Father in heaven, thank you that you pursue me. You see my heart, you see the trouble, the sin, God, you pursue me anyway. So God, today I I quit. (laughs) I quit my own agenda. I quit running. I quit living in in my pride and my arrogance and I humble myself before you. And I ask that you would cleanse me of my sin and all unrighteousness. God, you'd give me a new heart and you'd plant your spirit within me. God, you would begin this new journey. You'd make all things new. God, today I confess I'm yours. I belong to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,